Hi, it's that time of year again. Time for another one of our patron builds. And if you're like, what the heck's a patron build? I've never heard of that. Well, you haven't been watching the channel very long. Twice a year, we give the opportunity to our patrons to win a chance for me to come out to their shop and build a project with them. They can choose whatever they want to build. They get $1,000 in materials and we have five days to get it built. I mean, they can go over $1,000, but we're only paying for $1,000. Anyways, this video is us flying out to Atlanta to build with our winner, Greg, and the project he chose, well, it just might be one of my favorite projects to date. And we didn't build it in five days. We got it done in only four. So watch the video, see how we made it, and there's plans available in the video description if you wanna build one yourself. Okay. I got one. Ready? I haven't entered. Hello? Hi, is this Gregory Atwell? This is him. Did you won the Bourbon Moth competition thingy, but what's it? Oh, you're kidding me. I was just watching the live stream. Oh, you're watching the live stream. Um, where are you from, hey, man? Uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia? Hey. hey, 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 we're at it again. We're in Georgia this time, and uh, we're on another patron build. Gregory Atwell was the winner this time. And we're heading over to his house right now. Gonna meet him and figure out what we're building. Greg actually lives just outside of Atlanta proper in the town of Marietta. Now Marietta is actually a pretty big city with a small town feel. Their town square seems like the type of place that you might find a big city girl who comes to the small town, meets a country boy, and falls in love with Christmas. Greg lives at the end of a quiet little street where he's got a nice shed shop in his backyard that he builds various projects from small furniture items to kids' toys. He's got a beautiful dog that's rambunctious and playful. He's got a hairy daughter, and he's got a cute wife. I might have mixed up the description of those three somehow. Anyways, we showed up at Greg's house, got to know each other for a bit, and then dove right into work. Now the project Greg wanted to build was this outdoor pergola seating area. But after looking at this picture for just a few minutes, I realized it wasn't real. By that I mean it's an AI generated photo that doesn't actually exist. When you start to look at it, you can see that nothing really makes sense with the construction. You got brace pieces connecting to nothing, the benches are just floating in midair with no support, flower pots that just dive into the wood surface. So we got on SketchUp and started to kind of mock things up, more just to get an idea of how much wood we needed than anything else. With somewhat of a lumber list, we headed out to Gus's world famous fried chicken. I'm starting to think I might gain weight on this trip. After a quick bite to eat of southern health food, we headed to Peach State Lumber, where Greg assured me they would have everything we needed. However, when I asked about dimensional cedar for our pergola build, well, they didn't have any. Thank you for calling Builders First Source. All associates are busy helping other customers. So after a little Google searching, I found another lumber yard nearby. The only problem was not only did they not have any lumber, they didn't have any people either. It was completely empty until we wandered way in the back and found a lady sitting at a desk doing paperwork. You can't order it from you? Uh, there's nobody here to order. Oh, well. We don't have people here. I, I guess we'll go to this other place. So after being told they're a lumber store that doesn't actually sell lumber, we went on to place number three. They told us they also don't have cedar, so it was on to place number four, where we quickly found out that cedar on the East Coast is insanely expensive. So we switched gears and decided to build the entire thing out of pressure treated wood, which only cost us about $600. Had we gone with cedar, it would have been over 4,000. The fun part was trying to load all of our lumber into the back of Greg's Chevy Colorado. I was pretty sure at any moment Greg's suspension was gonna break, 
but we managed to make it home without any issue, and Greg even took down his fence in the backyard so we could pull right to where we needed the lumber to be unloaded. Next, we had to decide exactly where we were gonna build this thing. I tried to convince him to build it in this nice, flat, level spot, and, well, thankfully, they agreed. So it was off to Home Depot for a few more supplies, some bags of cement, and this double man auger contraption. Then we had to figure out exactly where we needed to dig our holes to set our four six by six posts that we were gonna build the entire pergola off of. So using a few boards and a tape measure, we marked out on the ground with a can of spray paint exactly where we wanted all four holes dug. Now in my mind, getting this auger was a great idea. We could dig all four holes quick and easy, get the depth that we wanted and move on. We dug the first hole, no problem. The second hole, easy. Third hole, just fine. And then of course on the fourth hole, well, we ran into something. It seemed like it was a big piece of hard wood. I assumed it was a root, so we started cutting it with the sawzall, started hitting it with the pickaxe. I actually ended up bending the pickaxe with whatever was down there. Then I tried to just use the shovel to scoop it out. That didn't work. Then Greg got his electric chainsaw that he said he didn't care if we dolled the blade. We tried to dig the hole with that thing, and we worked on it well into the night. Before we realized it wasn't a root, it was an entire stump. We got four days left. Do you think we're gonna get it done? I think we can get it done. I think we can. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. He thinks we can get it done. We can get it done. 100% I think we can. Me too. In the end, we decided three holes was gonna have to be good enough. And that fourth hole, although it's just about a foot deep, I don't think this thing will fall down. Next, we started building a frame that we could use to square up all four of our posts. We screwed the frame together with some screws, and then we started putting our posts into the holes. Now, in hindsight, we probably should have wrapped these posts with something, you know, to prevent rot in the future, but they are pressure treated, and I'm sure they'll still last for years to come. After inserting each post into a hole, we surrounded it with a nice layer of gravel. This held the post in place temporarily until we got all four of them nice and secure. Well, all three of them nice and secure. That last one was definitely a little questionable, but we just screwed it to our frame so it wouldn't fall down and made sure to shove a nice compact layer of gravel around the outside. Anyways, with all four of our posts in place, we grabbed some bags of quick set concrete and poured them in the holes. This stuff's nice because you just pour the powder in the hole, add a little water, mix in place, and let it sit. Really couldn't be any easier. Well, I mean, technically it could be easier. We could have like hired a cement truck to come in and just pour concrete already mixed in each hole, but that would have been expensive and time consuming, and I think it would have been overkill for the project that we're actually building. So a couple bags in each hole, a little water, and we were off to the races. Now our original plan was to do pavers underneath the pergola. But after digging in this dirt and realizing how hard it was and how many rocks there were and how unlevel the ground was, we all kind of unanimously decided that it'd be much easier to just build a wooden deck at the base of the pergola because we could level that to the posts, not get the ground level. So it was back to the lumber store to buy some decking material. Unfortunately, all the lumber store had was 16 foot lengths. Luckily, there was a construction crew working on a deck at the lumber yard, so I convinced them to let me use their saw and I cut the 16 foot boards down to eight foot boards. They were very nice. Then we loaded the eight foot boards into the back of Greg's truck. And once again, we drove back to Greg's house with his Colorado loaded down with some more wood and it was time to start cutting our lumber for the deck. There was just one problem. Greg's Ryobi saw didn't want to turn on. At first, I wasn't sure what the problem was until I found this mysterious electrical tape wrapped around the middle of the cord. After further investigation and Greg fessing up to what had happened, we learned that at one point he accidentally set the running saw down on the cord and cut it in half. Although he had rewired it, at some point those wires had come loose, so once we rewired it again, hopefully this thing will maybe not explode and turn on. 
There we go. We have a working saw. Let's build a deck. Now because the rest of the pergola is being built out of pressure treated wood, we decided to keep things consistent and build the entire deck out of pressure treated lumber as well. The first thing we had to do was create the under frame for all of our deck boards to sit on. So we cut pieces to fit in between all of our posts. Now we could have wrapped these boards around the outside of the posts and just screwed them in place, but I didn't think that would look as nice. So we got a few joist hangers and we decided to hang each supporting brace piece in the center of the post. That way we could overhang the decking past the brace just a little bit and it would look a little cleaner, nicer, more thought out. So working in tandem, me, Greg, and Craig, yes, that does get confusing started putting all of our frame pieces in place, just leveling them out as we went to make sure everything was nice and straight and level. After we got our four border pieces in, for lack of a better word, we started doing the internal supports. We did one on the other side of each post, kind of sandwiching that post in place, and then two more supports down the middle. Then for the actual decking material on the top, we wanted to do a complete frame around all four sides so you couldn't see any end grain, which meant that we had to add a little blocking in between those two brace pieces on the front and back. This allowed us to have something to rest those frame pieces on. Kind of like this, if you know what I mean. Once we had all four frame pieces around the outside, we took the measurements on the inside, made sure that it was nice and even from the left side to the right side, and then we could start cutting down our individual deck boards to fill in the center. This went pretty quick because Greg went into his shed shop and pulled out his DeWalt miter saw, and after checking that cord to make sure it didn't need to be rewired as well, we cut down all of our deck boards and just loosely set them in place. This was just to make sure that we had the sizing and the spacing correct to fit all the boards in there. Once we were confident with how they were gonna sit in there, we used pencils as spacers between each board. This gave us a perfect 3 8 inch gap in between each board, and we started screwing them down using deck head screws that pretty much disappeared into that wet pressure treated wood. And before lunchtime, we had our deck built. Now it was time to work on the upper structure of the pergola. Got some braces going this way and that way. I drank a little Red Bull and I flew. I flew. Oh, geez. This Red Bull stuff is bullshit. Now, I'm not gonna lie. I've never built a pergola before, but I've seen a lot of them, so I generally understand how they're supposed to be constructed. You basically have some brace pieces going one way and then you have some other brace pieces that sit on top of those brace pieces going the opposite direction. And many times I've seen that they cut the corners on the upper brace pieces to give them a nice little, you know, giant chamfer look. Now because the decking locked all the posts in place at the bottom, we knew the distance between posts was exactly what we wanted it to be down low. So we set our brace pieces down there and then used our post to mark out on the brace piece so that when we raised up the brace piece, well, we could line it up exactly where we wanted it to be. And we knew that the distance at the top would be exactly the same as the distance at the bottom. I don't know if this is how you're supposed to do it, but it just made sense to me as we were doing it. So we did it that way and well, it worked pretty good. We basically sandwiched the post in between two brace pieces on the front, making sure that they were both at the exact same height and level, and then we did the same thing at the back. If I remember correct, we left about a foot overhang on each side. Now we temporarily hooked these in place just with a few wood screws, but ultimately we wanted them bolted in place with carriage bolts that go all the way through the post and each brace piece. So after marking out on the outside of my board exactly where we wanted those bolts to go, I chucked up a nice long half inch drill bit and I tried to drill a hole through the post and those two outer pieces with this battery powered DeWalt drill. I kept getting a little ways in and then it would get stuck. It just didn't have quite enough power. But Greg said not to worry and he grabbed me this other drill that was a little bit bigger. This was a cobalt drill. I started using that, but it immediately started smoking and caught on fire. Like literally there was smoke pouring out of the top of it. So 
Didn't think that was gonna work. So with the drill still chucked up into the bit and the bit still stuck in our posts, we made a little trip to the fine woodworking store known as Harbor Freight. We found the biggest corded drill that they sold for a whopping $29. We brought it back. We chucked that drill up into our bit. We stuck it against the wood and we started drilling our holes. And then that drill immediately got stuck as well and wouldn't go any farther. And when we tried to get it to go farther, it started smoking too. At this point, I really didn't know what to do. Eventually, we went back to the battery-powered DeWalt drill we had started with, and by babying it along, just going in a little bit and out and in a little bit and out, we finally managed to drill all the way through our posts and boards, and we were ready to sink in some bolts. Yes, sir. They're not long enough. Oh my god, they're not. Yeah, these are um, only 8-inch. Well, that's embarrassing. Next time, we should probably buy the right length bolts. But we'll save that for another day. For now, the daylight was starting to come to an end and we still had our upper brace pieces to get installed. These we just made out of two by eights. We cut that same little 45 on each end and we did the same 12 inch overhang. As the sun set on the evening of day two, I was pretty happy with the progress we made. The main pergola was pretty much constructed at this point. And that evening, Greg's wife made us a true southern dinner. So we're told. With all the fixings. Even some interesting looking fixings. No, not the dog. These pear halves filled with Miracle Whip and sprinkled with cheddar cheese. I'm not too sure about this. But when you're not sure about something, the best thing you can do is just get it over with quickly. Yeah. Yeah. The roses are not turning green. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you eat it all together, it's not that bad. <laughs> But the Miracle Whip isn't my favorite. <laughs> this video is sponsored by AG1. It's one of my favorite products that sponsors the channel because I actually use this stuff and I love it. See, AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement. And if you don't know what a foundational nutritional, nutrition, foundational nutrition supplement is, well, it's a word that's hard to say, but it's also, oh. A foundational nutrition supplement means it supports your body's universal needs like your immune system, your gut health, energy, things like that. And that is exactly why I love AG1. AG1's formulation is actually based on the latest science and maintains the highest quality standards. Their stuff is actually peer reviewed in scientific journals. Have you actually looked at what your body needs on a day to day basis? It's quite a bit. Vitamins, nutrients, minerals, all that stuff. And then have you ever tried to actually hunt down all that stuff and take it? Will you end up with all these different pills and gummies and supplements? And it's a pain. The thing I love about AG1 is it's all in a convenient powder that actually tastes great as part of your daily nutritional supplement. You just, I couldn't find a spoon. Put the lid on. Tastes good, which is important. In the middle of the day, I was always reaching for a cup of coffee because I was getting the midday sleepies, but coffee doesn't do anything for you. And then I started adding AG1 to my daily routine. It still gives me that boost of energy, but I can feel good about what I'm putting in my body. So if you want to try AG1, go to drinkag1.com slash bourbon moth. And the really cool thing is that AG1 is going to give my entire community a free year supply of their immune supporting vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free travel packets. So go to drinkag1.com slash bourbon moth. Check it out. You won't regret it. It was the morning of day three and we were back at it early. So today is where... Greg thought it would be cool to make this a lot more complicated than it mm -hmm. needs to be and add some circles and giant eight-foot rings to mm -hmm. this thing. Yeah. 
Why did you decide to do that? Seems like it would be fun to do. I think it'll look good. And just to make it complicated since I got help. You've obviously never made an eight-foot circle out of pressure-treated lumber, have you? Nope. I don't think anybody has. All right, we're going to get into it. Day three, let's go. Now, I thought long and hard about the best way to make these rings, and I couldn't really come up with anything. So in the end, we just started cutting pieces. Now, the first thing I knew we were going to have to do was make some sort of template to get our round ring shape. So I knew the rings had to be roughly eight feet in diameter, so we grabbed a four by eight sheet of plywood and sticking a screw right at the very corner and using a board as an arm, we managed to trace out one quarter of an eight foot ring that is five inches wide. I quickly realized that one quarter of an eight foot ring was not going to fit on the two by 12s that we had bought to make the ring out of. So then we had to slim it down to one eighth of an eight foot ring. So we just cut the one quarter in half and well, that gave us one eighth. I rough cut it with that nice Ryobi skill saw and then we cut it out on our line with this wonderful Ryobi jigsaw. It did the job and after a little sanding, we had a pretty good looking one eighth of a ring template. Now we had 12 foot two by 12s. So we laid out our template onto one of those two by 12s and we quickly realized that we would just manage to get four eighths of a ring per two by 12. That meant we had enough two by 12s to get 32 pieces out of our two by 12s, which is how many we were gonna need to create our two rings because each ring would have eight pieces to complete one circle, but we were gonna double them up to get twice the thickness. So we'd need 16 pieces per ring and if my math's correct, that's 32 pieces that we had to trace out, rough cut with the chop saw, then rough cut again with the jigsaw, and then finally somehow cut these to our perfect ring shape. That brought me back to the fine woodworking store known as Harbor Freight, where I purchased this wonderful router table. It was on sale with a one and a half horsepower router included for just $99. So you know, it's gotta be quality. I didn't even bother putting the legs on the thing. I just took the entire top plate that already had the router hooked to it and screwed it to a couple of offcuts in between some saw horses. Now the only thing that gave me any confidence that this was actually gonna work was this half inch shank flush trim bit from Bits and Bits. This thing was a beast and I think even in this Harbor Freight router, it should do the job. So I plopped in some Isotunes hearing protection, slapped on some sunglasses and started cutting out some ring parts. I was actually really surprised how well this bits and bits bit ate through this wet pressure treated wood. The only issue we had was with our template. It was a little too thin to land on that bearing and became kind of a pain. So I broke it in half in anger and threw it aside. And I made another template, this time out of three quarter inch poplar, slapped that thing on the top, and now we were in business. Now it was cutting smooth as butter. I was busy working on the template, cutting out our ring shapes, while Greg was over there tirelessly rough cutting them with the jigsaw, and we were like an unstoppable team, cutting wood, making ring parts, making a mess. No, literally, I was making a mess because I stacked them all up and then they they fell over on Greg's saw. I actually felt really bad about that, but I tried to make up for it by letting him cut out the last few pieces while I watched. Because that's how we roll. Next, it was time to assemble our two rings. So we put our first circle layer down and then as you can see, we offset all of the seams for the upper layer. Now, I don't know if this did any good, but we got some exterior glue at Home Depot that says it's supposed to work with wet wood. It's made by Gorilla Glue and it's clear. So we squirted a bunch of that in between the two layers of wood. Then on either side of each seam, we added four of these true lock fasteners. We picked these up at Home Depot. They're exterior screws and they're two and seven eighths of an inch long, which worked out perfect for two layers of two by material. We just worked our way around adding fasteners on all the seams on one side 
and then we flipped the entire thing over and we added fasteners on either side of every single seam on the back side. Once we had that done, well, the rings were pretty good and locked together. We did this to both rings and boom, just like that, we had two eight foot wide rings that were gonna make up the frame for our bench components in between our pergola. While Greg finished up the screwing, I played with the Barbie dream car, and then we all sat down inside the circle of trust for a nice drink. All right, it's the morning of day four, but only the morning of day three for building. I'm here with uh, Greg, yep. and uh, yesterday was very repetitive. Greg spent the entire day running the jigsaw, and I spent the entire day at our fancy router table. But we got our circles done. How are you yep. feeling about today? Feeling good about today. Time to put a ring on it. He says he feels good about every day, so I'm a little confused. There's not been one day where he's like, I don't feel good about it today, which I've been expecting. But today we're putting the uh, rings in. Yep. Got those all constructed yesterday, and this should start to look, well, more ringy than yesterday. All right, anything else you want to say to the people? No, ready to get it done. Let's see what happens. All right. With no time to dilly-dally, we went and got our first ring, and as Beyonce says, the only double lines we cross is dollar signs. Although I'm not sure how that pertains to this particular thing that we're doing. Now, each ring was eight feet in diameter, but the opening that we wanted it to go inside was not. It was a little bit smaller. But this was actually by design because we wanted to be able to cut each ring to fit inside that opening. So we centered the ring in between our opening and we clamped it in place so it wouldn't wander around on us. Then with it clamped in place, we marked out exactly where the posts overhung the ring on the top and the bottom so that we could cut this material away with the circular saw. We did this on both sides and we also did it along the top. But the top is actually gonna become our bottom. So although we're marking it on the top, after we cut it, we're gonna flip the whole ring around and then our opening will be on the bottom, not the top. If that made any sense. If not, just, just wait, I'll show you what I'm talking about here. We laid the ring down, I connected my two points that I made on the outside to show what material we needed to cut away, and then I just freehand cut with that nice Ryobi circular saw right along our line. After we cut on the top, we removed our screws on the bottom, and we had to kind of pry our wood apart because, well, we glued it together. Now, this saw isn't quite big enough to cut all the way through two layers of two by material. So we cut through one layer and then flipped the whole ring over, used that initial cut as basically a guide for the router, and then flush trimmed the pieces to be the shape that we wanted. And that left us with this nice partial circular ring looking thing. Now you can tell what I'm talking about when we flipped it around so the mark we made on the top is now on the bottom creating an opening that you can walk through up onto the platform. Next, we had to make this look even on both sides. So I measured equal distances out from both the post on the left and the post on the right, and using a square, I drew a line, and we freehand cut it with a Japanese pole saw to get a nice, smooth cut and a uniform opening. It worked so well on the front side, we used this exact same method on the back side, and we cut that ring to fit in place on the back, and now we had a ring on the back, as well as a ring on the front, and this thing was really starting to take shape, a, a circular shape to be specific. We made equal cuts on the back so that our opening on the front and back was the same and then it was time to permanently affix our rings in place. For this we're using some extra long true lock screws, is that even what they're called? True lock? Lock tech? Something lock. Anyways. After pre-drilling, we screwed the ring directly to our deck and then threw our ring directly into those 6x6 six six posts and we left the top just free floating because we're crazy and you can't stop crazy. Then it was time to start working on our bench. And I quickly realized that the bench would look pretty darn cool if we made some more curved pieces. 
So using the same template we used for the ring, it was back to the router and the jigsaw and all that stuff to cut out some more 1 8 inch ring pieces. I then changed the template to have a nice soft curve along the back. We hooked it back onto our pieces. We added this curve to our curve pieces and it looked something like this. Then we did a little finagling, playing around with the placement to get the right height and depth for the bench that we wanted. And once we had that, we screwed it in place both to our ring and our post. And we duplicated this positioning for all four leg brace pieces. Then I stretched a two by four across just to make sure it was gonna support our weight, which it did. Next, we needed to build some sort of frame in between these supports to hold up our bench slats. So we cut a bunch of two by fours and two by sixes and a bunch of other random pieces. We set off cuts up there to figure out how many bench slats we needed. We marked on the inside of our leg to figure out where we wanted to end our frame. We had to make special support pieces in the middle of the frame and on the sides to match the curve of our support. So we did this just out of off cut pieces, just these little sections and then made this really unsafe cut on the miter saw because I'm a bad example. Don't try that at home. And then we made this cool little frame that will connect our brace pieces from side to side. Next, we hooked that frame in place. Now, we did this in a very certain way, so I really want you to see this. What we did is, well, Greg's kind of in the way. I'll move the camera. So, what we did was we, well, Greg, you're in the way again. Okay, he moved. So we, oh my gosh, fine. I'll just do it over here on this side. So what we did is we, are you kidding me right now? All right, stay put, Greg. We screwed the frame in place from the inside so there was no visible screws on the outside. And then what we did was we took this center brace piece and we, we, oh geez, I give up. We screwed that in place from the outside. Once we had our framing all done on one side of the bench, we duplicated it on the other and then I sat down to give it a test. And I was really disappointed. This thing is extremely uncomfortable. I think we might have to put some sort of seat on there. This was really easy. We just made it out of pressure treated two by fours and we clamped them all together so we could cut them with one go. This saved a lot of time. Then I just carried the two by fours over and we just set them in place on top of our bench. We figured we could fit four two by fours for the bench seat and four two by fours for the back of the bench and it gave it a pretty awesome look. I mean, this actually looked like we had planned it all along, which I assure you we didn't. We made this up as we went. But the final product looked like somebody spent a significant amount of time thinking it through. And I'm telling you again, we did not do that. In fact, we did the opposite and we spent most of our time drinking beer together and just laughing. And we probably should have spent more time planning. That is until you look at the final product and I mean, it looks like we spent more time planning, right? In the end, we made a pretty darn cool pergola bench seating area. Now, when we threw these brace pieces up, when we cut them, we realized we forgot to actually attach them to the top. So before we could call it quits, we had to toenail those in from each side with a few screws to adhere them permanently. While Greg did that, I took a nice little nap on the bench. And then last but not least, we had to cut those six by six posts down to size. Now sure, we could have used a sawzall or a chainsaw, but at this point, I thought Greg needed a little more exercise. I mean, we had only built an entire pergola in four days. And I didn't want him getting off too easy. I mean, normally we have to build these things in five days. How we managed to get everything done from digging the holes, to setting the posts, to building the deck, to building the rings, to adding the upper supports, to adding the bench that we didn't even know how we were gonna build when we started. How we managed to do all of that in four days, I will never know. It's probably because we had some great help and some great company. Greg is such a cool dude, and that is exactly why I love these patron builds, because you get to hang out with awesome people and build really cool stuff together. Oh, sorry, didn't realize the video had ended. 
What'd you think? That was pretty cool, huh? Greg's a neat guy. I was a little skeptical when he showed us that picture that turned out to be robotically created, AI. But we got it done, and I have to say, pretty happy with the result. I might have to build one of those in my own yard. If you enjoyed that video, well, give it a like, subscribe to the channel, but more important than that, if you want a chance to win the opportunity for yourself, well, then go in the video description, click the link to our Patreon, and sign up. Maybe I'll come out to your place next, and we can build a wooden basketball hoop. And then I can beat you at horse, or pig, or another animal. Or we can build whatever you want, really. We can build a dock. We can build a big wooden bucket. We can build some wooden shoes. Whatever, I don't care.